Hello. I'm going to share with you one vision of what the world might be like in 2089. But I'm not going to rely on the power of my argument alone. In order to win you over, I'm going to try and be charming and charismatic. If I do my job well, by the end of this talk, you'll think to yourself, oh my goodness, isn't Siobhan great? I'd love to have her around for dinner. But that would be a big mistake. You see, I'm one of those irritating vegans. I don't eat meat, I don't eat eggs, and I don't eat dairy. What on earth are you going to feed me? For the past 20 years, I have been the difficult one at the dinner party. But things have started to change a little bit recently. We seem to be in the midst of a mini vegan revolution. To give you just one example, vegan magnum ice creams are available at 7-Elevens around the country. Now, when I told people that I was going to talk to you about what the world might look like for animals in 2089, I was overwhelmingly greeted with looks of concern. It seems that most people think that there's something problematic about our relationship with animals. Now, this is the part of the talk where I'm going to paint a picture of the current state of human-animal relations. It's also the part of the talk where you're going to think to yourself, oh, my goodness, she wasn't kidding. Vegans are so depressing. Never invite one around for dinner. <laughs> OK. Let's start with the elephant that one day will no longer be in the room, and that species extinction. According to the International Union for the Conservation of Animals, a quarter of all mammals are at risk of extinction. We are heading towards a future that features loads and loads of humans, but no mountain pygmy possum, no Javan rhinoceros, and no Franklin's bumblebee. But extinction is only one of the ways in which humans harm animals. I'm a public policy scholar. I study and research policy making and policy analysis. One of my areas of specialty is the way we construct animal welfare law and how those laws work to afford preferential treatment to some animals and not others. If I had to sum up my research findings after more than a decade and a half, I'd say this. Even among animals, it pays to be good looking and popular. According to the United Nations, every year we kill for our dinner 50 billion chickens. We also kill 140 million tonnes of marine animals that we call seafood, and we kill, kill many more millions pigs, sheep, goats and cattle. At the moment, there are three times more farm animals alive on Earth than there are humans. So when I say that we are heading towards a future that features loads and loads of humans and not many other animals, what I should really say is that we are heading towards a future that features loads and loads and loads of farm animals, loads of humans, and very little biodiversity or wildlife. OK, how are we going? I wasn't joking about the depressing bit, right? But there is some good news. Are you ready for some good news? I've identified two trends that, when combined, I think might make the world a better place for animals in the next 70 years. Let's start with trend one. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, trend one is also a little bit depressing. <laughs> but we're going somewhere good, so stay with me. Recently, my father's been sick and he's been in hospital. When he's in hospital, we worry about his exposure to superbugs. Superbugs are bacteria that are resistant to all or nearly all antibiotics. When we started producing commercial antibiotics in the 1940s, they were revolutionary. Antibiotics saved lives. But as soon as we started doing that, bacteria began to develop resistance. As the, as the bacteria evolves, we need stronger and stronger antibiotics in order to fight the infection until there are no antibiotics left that are strong enough. What remains are superbugs. The reason we worry about my father when he's in hospital is that superbugs are most prevalent in places where we use a lot of antibiotics. Unfortunately for us, we are heading towards an antibiotic-resistant future. According to the World Health Organization, the 21st century could well be a time in which common infections, minor injuries, 
will be life-threatening. Okay, how are we going? We're talking animals, we're talking antibiotics, we're talking, what, where's this first trend? What's going on? Okay, stay with me. It's all going to come together in a moment. Now, I'm going to assume that nobody in this room has seen a mountain pygmy possum, for reals. That makes perfect sense. They're critically endangered. But in the past year, how many live chickens have you seen? Is it 50 billion? Where are all these chickens? When UNSW was founded 70 years ago, plenty of people living in this area would have had a couple of chooks in the backyard. I did growing up in Gladesville. Now we have 50 billion chickens and they live overwhelmingly in factory farms. Factory farms are cramped environments. Many hundreds, if not thousands, of animals live together in sheds. Typically, factory farms use a lot of antibiotics. It's been estimated that between 75 and 80% of all the antibiotics we produce globally are fed to farm animals. Not to sick humans, they're fed to farm animals. And the animals aren't even sick. It's not fed to them for therapeutic reasons. They're fed to farm animals simply to keep the animals alive and in some countries to make them grow more quickly. And we're not just feeding them our old stuff. In the UK, a quarter of all chicken samples just from the local supermarket were found to contain antibiotic-resistant E. coli. We've got to decide, what do we prefer? Chicken nuggets or antibiotics? Now, before you ask, don't forget, I can do your great veggie curry if you come around to mine. But I'm only joking because I know that meat means a lot to a lot of people and I'm not going to try and take away your meat. But I think there's a way we could have both hamburgers and antibiotics and that's because of my second trend. So we really are at the good news bit now. This is, I promise this bit is really, really sincerely good news. We are now on the cusp of being able to grow meat in the lab. So for the past 10 years, plant-based Meat, cheese and milk alternatives have been getting better and better. More palatable, more available, more authentic. But even better than that, we can grow meat in the lab. So the first lab-grown burger has been prepared and served in the UK. Apparently it tasted very meaty, which is a good thing. The technology isn't perfect. That burger cost $400,000 to produce. It also required fetal bovine serum, which is blood from unborn calves. But the technology will improve, and it will improve quickly. Some of the world's richest people are investing in lab-grown meat, and soon we are going to have affordable, available lab-grown meat that requires only a few cells from a living animal. I don't see myself eating lab-grown meat. I'm used to being the difficult one at the dinner party. But... Plenty of people will, especially once it's cheaper than traditionally grown meat. I'm going to feed it to my cats. So will factory farming be a thing of the past in 2089? I certainly hope so. Factory farms are sites of trauma. But it's not just that I feel really sorry for the animals that have to live inside the factory farms. I also really, really, really love antibiotics and I want us to have them in the future. A cut on the hand should be a minor issue, not something that could kill you. But factory farming is also associated with species loss. Animal agriculture requires a lot of land clearing, and growing meat the old-fashioned way, not in the lab, is water and energy inefficient. My hope for the future is that in 70 years from now, we have lots and lots of animals on planet Earth, but I also hope that they're mountain pygmy possums, Javan rhinoceros and Franklin's bumblebees, not chickens, sheep and pigs. But of course, only time will tell. Thank you.